Yeah, I think Eugene is muted. Right. Shalom Ken, nice to see you. Hello there, whenever you're ready. This is a kumzitz, okay. Hello everybody. Welcome to part two. Can you all see the shared screen? Yes. Okay. okay. So modern orthodoxy, <clears throat> this week we're focusing on the present. By the present, we mean the 20th century. Last week we talked about the various factors and reactions and counter reactions that brought us till the 20th century. And to start off, I wanted to share with you this, I think a very excellent quote that's in a book by Zev Elif, uh, Modern Orthodox Judaism. <clears throat> and it's a quote from Rabbi Dr. J.J. Schechter. In this American world that celebrates personal autonomy and individual choice, orthodoxy has found a place. For more than a hundred years, it lived in the lives of dispersed individuals committed to it who acted alone, bereft of any institutional infrastructure or support. And then somewhere in the second half of the 19th century, it found expression in robust communities that were beginning to be founded and developed. True, Orthodoxy's place in American Judaism was far from assured. Even as late as the 1950s, its decay was predicted and noted in respected circles. But American Orthodoxy has resoundingly confounded these negative prognostications. The greatest sociological surprise or miracle, depending on one's perspective, of 20th and 21st century American Judaism is not only the dogged continued presence of orthodoxy in this country, defying all odds, but the extraordinary growth that it's experienced. Orthodoxy has achieved a presence and prominence in America simply and literally unimaginable even 50 years ago. So, that is a true statement, it really feels like a true statement. So let's launch into um, an overall very high level description of modern orthodoxy in the 20th century. There are so many topics, there are so many launch points to talk about. There is no way that in one hour we can talk about them all, but we'll try to highlight some of the more, more important ones, some of the more interesting ones. And we start out by saying that the main beliefs that differentiate the modern Orthodox community from the Haredi community are generally agreed to include the following. Number one, the positive attitude towards the value of secular education alongside lifelong Torah learning. Number two, the centrality of the state of Israel as the homeland of the Jewish people. Number three, the importance of providing women with Torah education at a sophisticated level. Number four, a liberal and welcoming approach to non-Orthodox Jews, as well as to non-Jews. And number five, a healthy respect for experts in behavioral, physical, and medical science, providing insights in areas of their expertise, rather than a total reliance on what's come to be known as Das Torah. Similarly, an inclination <laughs> to trust the particularly community's Marada Atra for all but the most complex halachic questions where he's expected to seek further guidance. Rabbi. First, the first seeds, everybody see the, see the picture? Yes. The first seeds of American modern orthodoxy began to sprout around the educational and communal activities of YU and the RCA, the Rabbinical Council, particularly through the efforts of its leader, Rabbi Yosef Dov Soloveitchik, who's depicted here. Any of you who, who were able to join in in the course last year or who have read books and articles about the Rav know he started out in Lita and Poland. <clears throat> he went for education in Berlin he moved to Boston, became the rabbi of Boston. And his father being at Yeshiva University as Rosh Yeshiva, when he passed, he took over for his father and began commuting to New York. There was a great fight over his appointment at YU. Great fight. As a matter of fact, I want to share with you an anecdote. One of my rabbeim, maybe the rabbi of one or more of you, was Rabbi Yerucham Gorelik, Zichronel of Racha, who was... I would say not an opponent of the Rav, but certainly 
<clears throat> a bar plukta of the Rav. And he used to say in Shir, and apparently he said this each year, he would glare, glare at us suddenly in the middle of a Taisus, and he would say, you have no covet for me. You have no covet for me. If my name was Professor Yerucham Gorelik, then you would have covet for me. Professor J.R. Gorelik. So we understood what he was saying. The Rav was a democratic elitist, believing in authority of the Bali Hamasora, while believing that everyone should learn Torah, everyone, not limited to the few. He was unique in not encouraging all his students to become rabbis or Rashi Yeshiva, but to embrace professions while remaining dedicated to the mastery of the Torah. His articles and lectures spread the influence of his ideas through the modern Orthodox community, and he was its indisputable spiritual leader. There was a period in the 40s when consider, and we mentioned this last time, when consideration was given to merge the Jewish Theological Seminary and Yeshiva University. However, the traditionalists of YU argued that JTS was not an Orthodox institution and their view prevailed. In the following years, <clears throat> Orthodoxy fought a pitched battle with conservative Jewry over such issues as mixed pews and microphones. For years, modern Orthodoxy was actually in the weaker position as is evidenced by the many graduates of rabbinical seminaries such as Ritz, Ner Yisrael, and others who accepted positions in conservative synagogues due to the dearth of openings in the Orthodox community. But by the second half of the century, it became clear that Orthodoxy had prevailed over the conservative movement's challenge. Zionism as a topic. The Rav was a proud convert to religious Zionism and its prime spokesman. In his famous works, Chamesh Drashot and Kol Dodi Dofeik, he spoke eloquently about the need for the community to listen to God's call for Aliyah. Although for complex reasons, he only visited Israel on one occasion, choosing to remain in the United States as a Torah teacher, he was the single greatest advocate for Zionism in the modern Orthodox community. This placed him and the community at direct odds with the Haredi community, who were either neutral about the state of Israel or openly opposed to it on theological grounds, as in the case of the Satmar community. Their leader, the Satmar Rav, Rabbi Yol Teitelbaum, in his book, Vayoa Moshe, openly termed the Zionist state as an abomination, and he characterized all of its supporters as kofrim, as heretics. Moving along, the, the state of modern orthodoxy can be summoned up, summed up like all of Jewish life by the words food, family, and philosophy. This is the punchline of a wonderful joke. I hope most of you haven't heard it. I know a few of you have certainly heard it. There's a yeshiva bacher who has clueless about what it means to date, and he's beginning to date. And he says to his chavrusa, who's been out there for a little while, what do I say to the girl? I have no idea what to say to the young lady. So he said, it's very simple. You sit down, everybody is interested in food, family, and philosophy. So just bring those topics up. All right, so he goes to the date. They're sitting in the hotel lobby. And he looks at her and he says, I, He's bereft, he doesn't know what to do, but he remembers the three words. So he says, okay, food, food, food. He says, do you like Kegel? So she says, nope. Okay, one gone. What's the next one, next one? Oh yeah, family, family. Do you have a brother? Nope, only sisters. Well, two are gone. He has one left though, philosophy, philosophy. Okay, I got it. Tell me, if you had a brother, do you think he would like Kegel? So that about sums it up. So let's talk about food. The story of Kashrus in America is one of great success, and it wasn't always this way. The kosher food market has been was valued at almost 20 billion, not million, billion dollars in 2018. It's projected to reach 25.6 billion by 2026. The OU is their certification agency of about 70% of kosher food worldwide. 
and is the largest of the big five agencies, which include OK, CUFK, STAR-K, and CRC. It was founded in 1923 by Abraham Goldstein as the first independent agency. The U inside of the O was first placed on Heinz, Heinz vegetarian baked beans. It now certifies close to a million products in over 12,000 plants in 104 countries. With 886 mashkichim and 50 rabbinic coordinators, it's now the world's largest kosher certification agency. Also, in a typical US market, it's estimated that more than 60% of products, 6-0, carry some sort of kosher certification. So these are staggering figures, given that orth kosher Jews in the US number only a few hundred thousand. In any case, it was not always so. You see an example of the OU's kosher certification, and here is just a portion of the various symbols that are out there today. It's a growing list all the time. Telling you that it's not always so is the springboard is from the story of Rabbi Yaakov Yosef. In the 1880s, Rabbi Jacob Joseph, Yaakov Yosef, was brought from Vilna to serve as a chief rabbi of New York. His responsibilities included leading a Bezdin and organizing Jewish education. His principal task, though, was to bring order to the system of kashras. He was set up rent-free in a comfortable apartment in Henry Street and paid $60,000 in today's currency. What was the problem? At the time, the shachtim mashkichim were employed by the meat industry and there was much corruption. Rabbi Yaakov Yosef wanted to institute a European model in which all of these would be employed by the community. And to fund this, he proposed a fee on each pound of chicken symbolized by a tag, a plumba. Many of us remember seeing those plumbas. Are they still around? I think they are perhaps on chicken, don't remember. But no one was happy. The meat sellers resented the intrusion, the other rabbis resented his authority, and the immigrants experienced it like a Russian kosher meat tax. That's what it reminded them of. The plan fell apart by the early 1890s. Two other chief rabbis emerged as rivals. Rabbi Yaakov Yosef was fired, and he was left to fend for himself as a mashkiach. He died on June 16, 1902. His funeral drew thousands of mourners as it passed a printing press factory on Grand Street. Anti-Semitic employees tossed water, bricks, metal, and junk onto the mourners' heads. When the police showed up, they went after the Jews rather than the attackers, resulting in the worst outbreak of anti-Semitic violence that the city has ever seen. So kashrut supervision in America got off to a very, very rough stop. Similarly, in 1943, Rabbi Soloveitchik was given much grief when he tried to reorganize kosher meat marketing in Boston. In December of 1943, the YU commentator reported, after an exhaustive investigation of 14 months, Judge A.K. Cohen, the prominent Boston jurist and the leader of the city's Jewish community, announced the complete vindication of Rabbi Dr. Joseph E. Soloveitchik from all charges, he further declared that the accusers knew the charges were totally untrue and made them in malice with the intent to harm his reputation. This was a situation that prevailed earlier in the 20th century in New York and in, in, in other places in America. That's the first discussion of food. We'll now move to the second. The case of Pesach peanut oil. At the turn of the 20th century, chicken fat was the critical ingredient for Pesach recipes. As late as the 1920s, producers didn't yet offer much beyond matzah and kosher soap. There, was no, there were no ashkachas for canned foods. Chocolate was chametz, butter was better not. With the advent of Crisco, it became a replacement for heavy fats and oils but on Pesach, it was considered kidney oat. So Jewish women greased their pots with chicken fat, and that meant that Pesach was a fleshic holiday. We all remember, I think, that when, from our childhoods. It was largely fleshic. 
This changed in the 30s when peanut oil became popular in America. Jews had never heard of a ban on peanuts in connection with kidney oil. Most immigrants were Litvaks. Their rabbis permitted peanuts. In the 19th century, a Yitzhak inspector of Kovna ruled that oils extracted from kidney oils could be used as long as the product was checked for grain before production. In 48, the RCA and OU approved the use of peanut oil on Pesach. However, by the 1940s, I'm sorry, 1990s, the OU Pesach guide wrote, wrote it is questionable if peanuts are kidney oat and if oils are kidney oat. A bold reversal. What happened? Well, by mid-century, large numbers of Jews from the Ukraine and Hungary had come to the US. Their tradition, especially the Hungarians, was filled with rigidness and stringency. For example, they considered machine matzah prohibited on Pesach. They prepared their foods using schmaltz only. They considered peanut oil to be kidney oat. The Hungarian folkways toppled the Litvak folkways. Peanut oil was a protracted battle for the claim of authenticity. The American culture that encouraged competition among migrating folkways made space for a stricter and more authentic kind of religious observance in the post-war period, particularly with regard to food. In 1966, Ramosha Feinstein said he saw no reason to refrain from peanuts and their oil on Pesach. He wrote Moshe 5, 370. The Satmer of Rabbi Yol Teitelbaum disagreed with Ramosha as he did <clears throat> on several other issues like birth control and the popular height of the Mechitza. What enabled the Hungarian folkways to prevail in so many areas? In the 70s, American society experienced a conservative upsurge as seen also among Christian groups. And Hungarian Jewish ways lined up with this conservative trend. Also, the Hungarian Jews dressed in a way that gave them an authenticity that couldn't be matched by the more modern community. So people started looking for approval from the more machmir elements. And one of the casualties was peanut oil on Pesach. Also, with the passing in 1986 of Rav Moshe and Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky and Rav Yitzhak Ruderman, American Orthodoxy lost its leading gedolim and increasingly began looking towards Israel, Israeli leadership for Pesach. And in Israel, peanuts were prohibited to Ashkenazim as kidney oat. So this put the nail into the peanut coffin. Which brings us to our next major topic, and that is family. First of all, the Yeshiva Day School movement. <clears throat> Due to the growth of yeshivas in Eastern Europe during the second half of the 19th century, many Orthodox Jews were exposed to the idea of yeshiva study, but very few attended. I, found, I recently found a statement that was surprising. Pre-war in Poland, the estimates are that at most one third of Polish Jews were religious. At most one third of Polish Jews were religious. After the Shoah, surviving Russian yeshiva succeeded in reestablishing schools in the US. First and foremost, Revar Kutler in Lakewood, Rabbi Leo Mayor Bloch and Rabbi Mordechai Katz in Cleveland, Rabbi Yosef Yitzhak Schneerson in Brooklyn. A significant push in Torah education began in 1944 with founding of Torah Masora by lead, leaders like Rabbi Kutler and five, Rabbi Feivelman de Lovitz, focusing on day schools, both elementary and high schools. These schools in themselves were a concession to modernity because many of these same rabbis had been opposed to schools combining religious and secular subjects. Also, many were coeducational, in some cases, except for Talmud study. The Rub's own school in Boston was co-ed in all subjects. Among the New York area schools which imitated and initiated this practice were Yeshiva of Moshe Soloveitchik, Central High School in Brooklyn and Manhattan, and SAR Academy. In 1940, there were 35 day schools with 7,700 students. By 2013, there were 861 day schools 
with 255,000 students. Those are across the whole Orthodox community. A significant portion of this increase is attributable to the infusion of post-war Jewish refugees. 41% of Holocaust survivors identified as Orthodox against 10% or less in the general Jewish, American Jewish population. The gap year, one of the positive growths, out, outgrowths of modern Orthodox Zionism was the start by mid-century of a pattern of US boys and later girls as well going to Israel after high school to spend a year studying in a yeshiva or seminary. This was the brainchild of Rabbi Tzvi Tabori of the Jewish Agency. Beginning with a modest number of students attending Yeshiva Karen Biyavna, after the 67 war, the numbers increased until it became the norm in the community. By the mid nineties, studies show that nearly 90% of boys and girls graduating from Yeshiva high schools went to Israel for at least a year. Another major factor of change, bat mitzvah. There were occasional attempts to recognize a girl's coming of age in Eastern Europe in the 19th and 20th centuries. The former in Warsaw in 1843 and later in Lemberg in 1902. In both cases, the occasion was marked by a party without any ritual in the shul. The American rabbi Mordechai Kaplan who was the first rabbi in the Jewish center in Manhattan, held the first public celebration of a bat mitzvah in the United States for his daughter Judith on March 18, 1922. At the time, most Orthodox rabbis strongly rejected the idea of a bat mitzvah. In November 58, Reb Pinchas Taitz addressed the Agudas Rabbanim regarding the threat of conservative Judaism, and he focused primarily on mixed pews and bat mitzvah. In early 1973, however, Rabbi and Mrs. Haskell Lukstein celebrated their daughter Mindy's bat mitzvah at KJ with a Sudha meal in which she gave a Dvar Torah. The custom spread to Lincoln Square Synagogue and to the Jewish Center. There were many who objected to this new custom, calling it an abuse of our holy religion, an abomination, and a reform that should not be observed by the Orthodox. Rabbi Moshe permitted a Kiddush for a bat mitzvah, because it's a custom in this country to host a kiddush for any kind of commemoration. You notice that's not an incredibly strong show of support, but at least he did not oppose it. The ruling, his ruling was roundly condemned by his detractors as accommodationist. In 1963, Rabbi Yechiel Weinberg, who you remember from our first lecture, ruled it should be observed. It's a positive thing to do, but only in homes, not in shuls. Finally, by the 80s, it became clear that bat mitzvah did not present a threat to orthodoxy. The most important ruling to this effect was that of Rabbi Yovadi Yosef, the chief rabbi of Israel, Sephardic chief rabbi, who wrote, nowadays, in the much more open society around us, it's essential to encourage girls by giving them bat mitzvah celebrations so as not to cause feelings of resentment by discriminating between them and boys. Another major, major, major issue which continues is the issue of agunot and the prenuptial agreement. Halacha says that in order for a Jewish divorce to be valid, the husband must place a get in his wife's hands out of his own free will. If he doesn't hand, have the intent to divorce his wife, no other party, person, or court can do so in his stead. A Jewish woman chained to her marriage because of her husband's inability to grant her a get is referred to as an aguna. You probably know, I'm sure, that Chazal over the centuries, from the time of the Gemara on through the current day, have tried to find any way that they could to free specific agunot. In certain cases, their hands have been tied because they were unable to do it, and it's a tragic, tragic situation. In, in partial response to that situation, during the 80s and 90s, a prenuptial agreement was developed under the auspices of the Rabbinical Council of America that penalizes either party who refuses to grant or receive a get. 
Because just like we need the agreement of the husband to give again, we need the agreement of the wife to accept again. The RCA in 2006 issued a resolution declaring that rabbis should not officiate at a wedding where a proper prenuptial agreement has not been executed. And in fact, it's been reported that in recent years, with the acceptance of the prenuptial agreement in the modern Orthodox community, the problem of recalcitrant spouses has been largely solved among couples who sign a prenuptial agreement. The problem of General of Aguna continues and is begging for solutions. Another major area, women's education and Talmud study. For centuries, traditional Jews were reluctant to teach girls the oral law. And this is based on a statement in the Gemara that is opposed to women being taught um, Torah Shabbat Peh. In the early 20th century, schools began to be established by Mrs. Sarah Schneer, Schneerer, who was a Polish Jewish, Jewish school teacher who became a pioneer of Jewish education for girls. She realized that the young Jewish women of, our of her time were facing a spiritual crisis. The Polish government had introduced compulsory public education and the Jewish young women who were ignorant Jewishly were now receiving a secular education. So you had a situation where the young girl could not read a Chumash was illiterate, only copied what her mother did, which certainly took her a long way, but was really illiterate Jewishly. And yet she was reading French literature and German literature and the imbalance was, was just too striking. A vast and exciting world began to unfold for these women and it caused them to feel estranged from their parents and their lifestyle, the imbalance of, of literacy on the one side and illiteracy on the other. So Rishnira knew that the only way to combat these environmental forces was through Torah. She sought and received the support and encouragement of the Gedolim, including the Chavetz Chaim, the Gera Rebbe, and Rav Chaim Ozer Grozinski. I recently heard a very interesting uh, anecdote I had not known before. Everybody knows that she started with the Beis Yaakov in Krakow. And from there, the Beis Yaakov movement grew tremendously. And there were dozens of Beis Yaakov schools all over Poland and beyond. The question is, how did she, how did she manage to start the first Beis Yaakov in Krakow? She did not have tremendous popular support. The mystery was solved recently by an individual who, who knew the following story. Rabbi Leo Young was the second rabbi of the Jewish center in Manhattan. One day, he received a communication from Sarah Schneerer begging him to help her raise money so that she could found the school in Krakow. She was reaching out across the Atlantic for help from the American Orthodox community. Rabbi Young, said that he, he crossed the park, so to speak. He crossed the park and he went to visit Mrs. Schiff and Mrs. Warburg. I'm sure many of you recognize those last names. These were the people who were the leaders of conservative reform Jewry at the time. Temple Emanuel, sorry, it was, it was reform Jewry. These were the richest families of the, the Jewish community. And he said that Mrs. Schiff and Mrs. Warburg funded the first Beis Yaakov in Krakow. It's an amazing, amazing story of cooperation, of reaching across the aisle from one side of the Jewish community to the other and look, and look at the outgrowth of this generous act. So she began a revolution in the Torah education of girls and women that encompasses both the modern Orthodox as well as Haredi communities. It's striking to note that the Haredi communities teach their girls at a very high level, 
certainly Tanakh, and also Halacha, which is all Torah Shabal Peh. It's all coming from the Mishnah, from the Gemara, and from the Rishonim and Akronim. Of course, we know that the Rav Zetzal's trailblazing, trailblazing Talmud Shir at Stern College on October 11th, 1977, was a major step forward towards teaching Talmud to girls, which is so common in our day. If you look at this picture, I hope you can all see it. Here in the middle, can you see? Just nod. Stu, can you see the picture? In the middle, you have Rabbi Saul Berman, who organized it. He pushed for it. And on the right side, anybody see Rabbi Mordechai Willig? This is Rabbi Mordechai Willig, who was very much a part of it. And of course, Rabbi Lam, Zichron Levracha. Moving on from women's learning, we come to another very interesting phenomenon of the 20th century, woman's tefillah. In the 1960s, Orthodox women's only tefillah groups began to be established, consisting of women who wished to maximize women's participation in communal prayer while remaining within the halachic parameters of the Orthodox community and to meet regularly to conduct prayer services for women only. Some of you may remember that the first group began in 1972 on the Yom Tov of Simchas Torah at Lincoln Square Synagogue in Manhattan. With the support of its rabbi, Rabbi Shlomo Riskin, the women of Lincoln Square were given Torah scrolls for the celebration of Simchas Torah. They were permitted also to convene a separate Torah reading. Rabbi Riskin claimed that the Rav approved this practice. He claimed that he had had a conversation with the Rav in which he told him that this would be fine. But the Rav in fact never issued a public statement on the matter. That does not contradict Rabbi Riskin's statement, but it just makes it harder to defend it because the Rav did not go on the public record. Ramosha Feinstein, and others were very strongly opposed. They were very strongly opposed because they felt that it was something that was motivated by feminism, which to them was a red flag. Many, many of the Torah leaders saw women, women's uh, attempt to assert themselves and to gain, the, to gain the ability to do things that they've been excluded from as being motivated by chukah sagoi as being motivated by feminism. And they had a very binary attitude about it. The mainstream Orthodox, I'm sorry, by, by the late 1970s, several groups began to meet on a monthly basis. Between 1978 and 1980, Tefila groups were formed in such places as Baltimore, St. Paul, Minnesota, Riverdale in the Bronx, Washington Heights, Teaneck, New Jersey, Flatbush, and communities in Canada. Now the mainstream modern Orthodox rabbis and community leaders rejected the women's fila groups for reasons that ranged from the halachic to the sociological. The issue came to a head in 1985 with the publication, many of you may remember, of the tshuva by five highly regarded Yeshiva University rabbis. The position paper viewed the movement as stemming from and copying the feminist movement in America with no serious spiritual or religious basis. And it prohibited all organized women's prayer groups in any form. Nevertheless, by 2000, there were 33 women's tefillah groups in the US, 22 in New York, as well as 57 other groups worldwide. At this point, it's unclear what the future role of these groups will in fact be within the Orthodox community. This was a movement that was very strong in the second half of the century. Our feeling seems to be that with the rise of opportunities in women learning and in becoming Yawatzot halacha and also acting as religious leaders in the community, there's 
this idea of women's tefillah has sort of taken a back seat to these other major, major initiatives. This is just a picture of one of the tefillah groups. You can see I'm prejudiced. I chose one from Tinek. This is them on Purim. This is not how they looked every Shabbat. Don't get nervous. It's the Purim Megillah reading. Okay, we move on into the area of philosophy. This is a huge, huge topic. I'm only going to touch on a few aspects. If you find that after the end of the discussion today, there are other things that need to be covered, some of them will in fact be covered next time. And we can certainly, I'm leave, trying to leave some more time for discussion today. So philosophy, some principles. The motto of Torah Umada, which we hear so much of, which is the motto of Yeshiva University, which is the name of one of Rabbi Lamb's most important books. Torah Omada means Torah and knowledge. It's not, it's not Torah and low popular culture. It was meant to refer to the charge to Orthodox men and women to learn as much Torah as possible, as well as science, literature, art, philosophy, music, namely high culture, not crass, profane culture. Torah Amada is not a heter for indulging in the popular American culture exclusively and trying to meld that with Torah because it doesn't work very well. Second, our community rabbis are the address for perplexing questions of halacha. They are the address. Should they decide to do so, they will reach out to acknowledge Torah experts, known as Gedolei Torah. People ask, where are our modern Orthodox Gedolim? So it's a matter of definition. It's a matter of how the term Gedolim is defined. You truly don't need to look any further than synagogue rabbis in Bergen County, in West Hempstead, and other communities across the US. And of course, several of the Russia Yeshiva, Yeshiva University, Lander College, and across the broad landscape of Israeli Dati Leumi Yeshivot. But you may ask, who elected them as Gedolim? Who made them Gedolim? The answer is very simple. The community knows who are the Gedolim. The Torah community knows when they hear Torah, they know who Gadol is. But let's say, let's look, how did the Haredi world choose their Gedolim? That's where we keep hearing the word Gedolim, the Gedolim in New York, the Gedolim in Israel. The answer is simple. They are the rabbis appointed by the Agudis Yisrael to be on the Moetzek Gedolim Yisrael. The story is told of Reb Moshe Sherer. He was a great Aguda leader. He walked into a room once where Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky was sitting along with other leading Rosh Yeshiva in Gedolim. And Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky stood up for Rabbi Moshe Sherer. Asked later why he and acknowledged Gadol stood up for a layman. He replied, if we stand up for a Gadol, shouldn't we stand up for the one who decides exactly who is a Gadol? Take a moment with that. It was a very insightful comment by one of the Gedoli Hador. Our worldview focuses on taking the best of modern science and culture to enrich our understanding of how the Torah wants us to live our lives. We don't believe in historical revisionism, reshaping the past so that it better fits our present ethos. A story about Revar and Lichtenstein, Zechron Levracha, the great Rosh Yeshiva of Har Etzion illustrates this. Revarin was asked by a young man, isn't it the case that the Rambam saw the world and lived in the exact same way as the Chazonish? 
Weren't they just the same? Answered Rav Aram, Really? Did the Chazonish spend his days like the Rambam, serving as a doctor to concubines in the Sultan's harem? So those are some of the main points I wanted to share today. I wanted to leave some time for discussion. Next week, we'll discuss the key challenges facing the modern Orthodox community in the years ahead, in the 21st century. So let me take off the screen share. One moment. Okay, and you can unmute yourselves, please. Rabbi, I have a question. Yes. Your first five points you were I can't, you just were muted. You're still on mute. Wait, we're still on mute. Just Allowing everybody to unmute yourself. Okay, I think you're unmuted now. Go ahead, start again. So my question is the five points you made at the very beginning of the class. Um, I remember walking home from Shul one Shabbos with a gentleman. First of all, what's between Haredi and, and modern Orthodox? I'd say the yeshiva world, I guess. And, and this gentleman was somewhere in between the two. And he got angry, I mean, really violently angry when I said we were modern Orthodox. He said, what is modern Orthodoxy? And it seems like those five points would be something that, that people would, have, would not seem so terrible to people other than the Haredi community. And I don't understand why people get so, get so upset about it I mean, modern orthodoxy to me seems like it goes from one extreme to some people very makele in some things and very machmir in other things. So the term kind of always confused me. And I tried to explain to this gentleman, but he got very angry at me. <laughs> and so, those five points seem like they're logical things to me. I may have to cut off in a few minutes and ring for a ride to a doctor's appointment. Oh, you ask us an incredible uh, question and you're going to cut, cut and run. Come on, you got to hang around for a minute. I hope not. <laughs> so so here, here's the, what's your first name? Robert. Robert. You know, Haredim are modern Orthodox Jews too. They're living in the modern period. Nobody is not living in the modern period. The difference is that they, they have a philosophy that reacts to, to modernity in one way. And we as modern Orthodox Jews that we call ourselves react in a different way. And by the way, it's not so binary. It's not so binary. I apologize if I made it seem like there are two ends of a pole. There's a lot of flow between, in between the two. There are plenty of people who are mostly, let's say modern Orthodox, but somewhat Haredi, somewhat Yeshivish and the same way the other way around. So you're right, it, it's awful when it just creates machloket and a lack of understanding. We need to promote understanding. Now you're free to go. <laughs> I'm still here. Next question. David, I just wanted to make a point of information. First of all, Yashukawa, um, the picture that you showed us of Rav Salavetra giving a uh, Gemara share to women, and you pointed out Rabbi Lamb and Rabbi Berman and Rabbi Willig sitting in the back with uh, her head on her her hands on her chin was uh, Dean Karen Bacon. I don't know what her role was in those days, but it should be pointed out she was back there today. She's the head of Stern College. Okay, okay. And thank you for that. And you know that the Rav said that the reason he went to give the shir, the Chodo of Atzmo, was that he, he could take the arrows. He knew there would be tremendous criticism and he himself felt he should put himself, you know, like a, like an officer in front of the troops, that he can take the arrows because he was worried if he wasn't the one, um, you know, others would get, would get um, struck down and it would be much harder to defend. Now, Larry, are you on? Yeah, I am. People are having trouble unmuting themselves. They should not, they're allowed. 
they're permitted to. Right. Is everybody having that issue? No, I'm fine. Hmm, don't know why that is. So if you having that trouble, please use the chat. I'm reading the chat. I think the an, another point about uh, women's Torah education, I think one of the uh, members that participated in that uh, share with Russ Oliveira, I don't know if it was a couple of uh, months ago or a year or two ago, when came forth with the opinion that perhaps Torah education for women has gone a little bit too far. So that's the other extreme. Yes. 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 Are, is okay. everybody able to unmute now? Yes. 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 Oh, yes. lovely. Okay. I, I hit a control which shouldn't oh, have okay. any impact, but it did. David. Didn't. David. Okay. Just one second. I wanted to finish with Stewie. It is really ironic that one of the individuals, as you say, who's in that picture, in recent in the recent year or two, said that perhaps we went too far with Jewish with Torah education for women. So, yeah. That is ironic. Okay, Susan. Yes, um, another difference that people have brought up over the years is Tzniyut. That the Haredi Yeshiva school is much more mocked on Tzniyut than the modern Orthodox world is. And if you talk to some Haredim, that's their big beef about the modern Orthodox community. They say, well, the women are not observing Tzniyut, so they can't be the same as we are. So that's, a, that's an issue that needs to really be addressed. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's probably the case that in the modern Orthodox community, there's perhaps more of a tendency on the part of some to dress more like the popular culture, like people in the popular culture. Without getting into a lot of controversy, if any of you have visited Flatbush in the last 10 or 15 years on a Shabbat, then you might have a different perspective on how the Haredi, some of the Haredi women are dressing, but we'll leave that open. <laughs> Uh, David, David, David. Isaac, you're next. I'm going to G. Yeah. Okay. Just, David, I, just um, you. Isaac, Isaac, just hold, hold one is, second. You're next. Go ahead. For the secular history. Well, we went for some reason. We went back. People can't unmute at the, again. Did we had go back to that? No. No. No, we're okay. okay. We're, on mute. we're on mute. So Gene is on mute. So, so I'm going to go to Isaac. and Yeah, so you mentioned that uh, one of the uh, operational uh, aspects of uh, the Haredi world is Das Torah as a way of, uh, you know, who to follow and how to make uh, communal decisions. What, what's the equivalent or is there an equivalent in the uh, centrist uh, Orthodox world, where you know decisions on, uh, on on issues outside of the realm of Torah are made, uh, like who to vote for, for instance. That's not that's not. So a, that's that's Torah. Yeah. That's not a Jewish. Just just a brief a brief answer. That Torah means it has come to mean, and it's a a very recent phenomenon. It didn't exist until the last hundred years or so. The, the idea being that any question that you have, you go to your, to your rabbi, and ideally the highest level godel you can find. Many scholars think that this flowed out of the Hasidic world, because as we know, in the Hasidic world, the philosophy was you ask the rabbi everything, every important life event you asked. But Das Torah said that whatever question you have outside, of course, Torah, but outside of Torah, who to vote for? Should you get it injected with the vaccine? You know, should you start this business venture? Should you, how do you react to some scientific finding? It didn't matter that the Torah contains all knowledge. And if I'm a God of the Torah, I can answer any of those questions. Mm -hmm. In our community, we say there's Torah and there's Mada. The, the Ben Torah, the Tamil Chacham, the God is the person we turn to on any question of halacha. But if it's a question that needs to be answered by a psychologist, a sociologist, a scientist, a mathematician, a business leader, that's the person you turn to. And, and the Rav articulated this very much, for example, in the case of Israel, when there was such a lot of talk about 
don't give up one inch and don't give away anything and don't talk about peace. And, and he said, talk to the generals, talk to the leaders who know the facts on the ground. If land for peace is gonna bring peace in their estimation, because they know the facts on the ground, then you go with what they say. So that's what it is. It, it's really that Torah in the way that the, it's experienced in the yeshivish community is all encompassing. And we, we tend to see it differently. Gene, you're unmuted. Let's go back. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, if I could just make two small points. The first regarding Sarah Schneerer and the Basie Aqua movement, um, we ought not to underestimate uh, the resistance that existed when she started this. In fact, uh, recent research has indicated that she had no rabbinic support in the Shiva. And the Chafet Chaim was often said to have been the, her main backer, only uh, supported Beis Yaakov a decade after it began. Hmm. So she really did it against the, the thrust of all the rabbinic opinion at the time. I mean, it, it reminds me a bit of, there was a movie recently in the last couple of years about a woman in Brooklyn who wanted to start a women's Hatzalah uh, organization. And she had to do objections of all the rabbinim in the community. And I think that's pretty close to what uh, Sarah Schneier did. Uh, the second issue, the second point I wanted to make is that with, with respect to modern Orthodox Godolim, people say, where are they? Um, it's not that modern Orthodox leaders know less than the Godolim in the Haredi community. Uh, it's just that the modern Orthodox community or the centrist Orthodox community doesn't invest them with this halo of a kind of a supernatural status. Um, they know just as much, sometimes more than the Haredi Gadolim. It's just that we don't put them on that kind of pedestal. But it's not an indication of uh, lesser Torah knowledge or you know, lesser of two, two very good points. Thank you. Tammy. Yeah, I, first of all, about Sarah Schneer, I don't know where you're getting your information from, but about six years ago, I did some research on it. And on the contrary, I was absolutely shocked that her opinions were highly regarded. And that part of it was that they saw attrition from the Orthodox Jewish community. And they felt that if they wouldn't catch those girls, they would lose them. And so I was shocked. I expected to see things that people seemed to be against her. That wasn't the case at all. The Rebbeim got together and they welcomed her because Okay. The other so the, the question is when when did the rebellion come around? That's that's the well, I don't think it was coming around. I think things were so bad the Orthodox girls were going to gymnasium, they were leaving, they were going to cities. I was shocked when I did I mean I I, I haven't done anything in six years, so I can't tell you what's happened in, in terms of Tammy, Tammy, let me just interject something on top of that. I don't know how many how well known this is. But at that same time, there was a tremendous shidduch crisis going on in Poland and Eastern mm -hmm. Europe. Tremendous. Namely, the young, women, women, the young women were saying no to the eligible young men that were yeah. available. And you were so far better educated by going to gymnasium, as you said, and reading books and so on, than the men that they were saying, I'm not gonna marry this ignoramus. And there were women who were remaining single into their twenties and thirties. So this is part of the background of what was going on at that mm. time. You know, it was not, it was not fiddler on the roof guys pre-war. Really <laughs> I wanted to make one other point that I think things are so stratified that everybody wants to be a little better than the next person and Kenny and I were learning the Daf Yomi a couple of days ago, and they had the concept of Marseille Ka Yehura. It seems to me that people want to Im imbue themselves with extra dignity at the, at the loss of the next person. I'm, a, I'm not a broccoli eater, you're a broccoli eater. It seems to me that we have so much stratification in our society that that's what's happened to, to Judaism that people are get, there's a pecking order and people are putting themselves ahead on the pecking order. And also I would say, in addition to what you're saying, there's a phenomenon that those who are close to us often are the ones that we're most critical of. 
right? When we see somebody, we look down at our feet and we see somebody else who's wearing a different shoe size, that's the one we criticize. Mm -hmm. the, the guy who's like 20 feet away, we don't notice their shoe size. We're not as upset. So the, the, these internecine wars really, really rage very often uh, among groups that really aren't all that different from each other, but they just don't like broccoli. <laughs> Next question. David. Uh, yeah, I just want to make a, an observation. The term modern orthodoxy today is not as applicable as it was in past times. There have been several attempts, even like uh, Rav Lem, Oliver Shalom, he called it central Judaism and so forth. I think today that the, the variations in the from world are such that we can really almost classify and make a separate uh, classification for modern orthodoxy as opposed to the to the right wing. In other words, it's, it's more than modern orthodoxy. Like you said before, like the dress of women today, the, young, the younger generation, almost all the from, from young women wear their heads covered, which was not in existence uh, only a few years ago. In other words, there's so many variations today in that field of modern orthodoxy. My feeling is this is orthodoxy. This is not Hasidic, it's orthodoxy. Right. It's, it, as, as opposed to what it used to be like. Yeah, it's a very good point. A number of years ago, uh, we were in Baltimore and we saw that the from community had put out a directory that listed everybody in the community. Uh, as a child of Holocaust survivors, I don't like to see Jewish directories with everybody's name in it, sort of make it easy for the next whomever. But anyway, in this directory, there was um, a, a page dedicated to Shiduchim. And, it's, and you could rip it out, you could fill it out and send it to an address and that group would help you. The categories that were provided I recall there were like 14 or 15 categories of frumkeit, modern, orthodox, machmir, mekel, in between every kind of thing. Yeah, so you're right. It's like very, very fragmented. And it's and like I said before, it's not binary. To say it's binary is, is not to be realistic. I think we have time where for does, another question or two. Where does the egalitarian Judaism fit in in modern orthodoxy? It this, this is a voice that's coming from I don't know where. Who's asking the question? Sarah Lazarus. Oh, Sarah. Hi. Egalitarian was it was coined by the conservative. It has nothing to do with orthodoxy. Well, I disagree. I mean, there there are lots of egalitarian shoals that use orthodox sedurum. What do you mean by what, is, what do you mean by egalitarian shoals? Well, I'm thinking of shoals that my daughter goes to in Israel where everyone is Orthodox and most of the women have their head covered, but they allow women to have a Leot. Uh, would that, David, would that be considered an Orthodox show? Um, it's, mm. it's, a, it's a question that would take us probably two weeks to go through and, I, and, I, and I, 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 que I question that. I know they do, they have a Leot when they have the women have their own minion. I haven't heard of one where there is a mixture of men and women and the women get aliyahs. It doesn't, I haven't heard of that yet. Yeah, it's, um, it's a movement. They do exist. It's not, it's not an orthodox show. Some are called partnership minyanim. I, I don't, I don't know who decides if they're orthodox or not, but they don't see themselves as conservative. <laughs> right, that's their, that's their self-definition. It would be a very, um, it complex halachic discussion 